thought we could start by just talking about the inspiration. I mean, you've, you've written 13 books and we were just talking, you, I mean, you just shared with me that um, uh, you found out that this is on Amazon uh, in the uh, number one book in the category of aging now, which is phenomenal. You also said that out of your 13 books, you haven't received any, nowhere near sort of the, the um, sort of the publicity and the response that you've seen, that you're seeing from this one. So maybe if you could just talk a little bit about your inspiration for this book and in, in maybe inside of that discourse, you can give us a bit of a background for this, the stage that you call sort of this post adult stage, which is, is, which is really what the, the whole book is about. Absolutely. The motivation for the book is very simple. I got older myself and I realized things were changing, that it wasn't the same as when I was an adult. And I use this very decidedly and carefully, this distinction between adulthood and the later stage, which I call our wisdom years. I realized that things were different, that things seemed to be different for my friends as well, other people who are, say, over 60, who were also saying that things were different. And they couldn't quite articulate why. So I started doing research with older people. I started doing surveys and interviews and and just conversations. And I realized that I was right, that things were changing. Uh, people were living a lot longer. The fastest growing group of human beings in our country are centenarians, people over 100. So if you're, yeah. if you're ready to retire, the old notion of retirement, say, at, oh, say 65, you could live yeah. another 35 years. You could live, what are you Absolutely. going to do at that time? What, what will you do at that time? How will you make the most of that time? How will you transform yourself? How will you alter consciousness in a way that allows you to make the greatest, wisest contribution and the most compassionate contribution you can make? All of those questions were alive for me when I realized that things were quite different now. Hmm. Yeah, and I, I think uh, in addition to... Um, uh, more longevity. I think there is also um, sort of these trends that we're seeing where um, much more instability in terms of job shifts, job transitions, and, and those types of things up, you know, up and leading up until the years of, uh, let's say, the 50s and the and 50, years of 50s and, and 60s. So I think there's even more opportunity um, may be perceiving that to, to, to have that period of pause and stop and think, you know, and just, uh, you know, sort of reinforce like, wow, okay, now we are, I, I expect that I will live a lot longer. What will I, just like you were saying, what am I going to do with the next 35, 45 uh, years? Well, interestingly enough, those questions are very important, but just as important is the notion that the, the motivations that were so critical when we were younger, the ones I wrote about in a whole series of books on peak performance, I wrote those in my 40s. They were about achievement and performance and success and getting ahead and all of those things that are very appropriate during the adult stage. What we find when we get older is that we're not as driven in the same way. It's not that necessarily that we lose energy. It's that we're not as motivated in the, in the same way. We're no longer climbing the ladder to try to get ahead. And what I found when I talked to so many older people was that two things really motivated them most. One was their relationships. They talked about oh. love and who loved them and who did they love and, and were, they, were they really satisfied with their relationships? Did they express their affection for people? And then second, was their work making a contribution in the world that was worthwhile? Was it just work for work's sake to, to make enough money to, to support your family? There's nothing wrong with that. But, but people wanted more than that. They wanted to make sure that there was a specific contribution they were making in the world. It doesn't have to be grand. It doesn't have to be glorious. It, could, it can be almost anything that makes a contribution to the lives of other people, in the lives of other people. Mm -hmm. And this is, I, I think, Dr. Garfield, this is what you, you talk about uh, in your book, uh, this making this shift between success thinking to legacy thinking. Is that really 
uh, what, what you're speaking of there. And can you just, just tell us a little bit more about that? Like what, what does that sort of look like and feel like practically uh, speaking? Well, practically speaking, people feel less motivated by the need to get ahead. You know, I'm 76 years old. I'm not thinking about getting ahead anymore. I'm not thinking about oh. climbing the ladder. I'm not thinking about achievement and, and all those things that motivated me so much when I was in my 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s. I'm thinking now of, of legacy, of what I'm leaving for those who come after me. And when I say legacy, I don't necessarily mean something grand and glorious. Uh, a le the, one of the most heartwarming legacies I heard when I talked to older people were the letters that they wrote to their grandchildren or their children or other people, letters they wrote about what was most important in their life, what lessons did they learn that were most critical that they wanted to pass on. They wanted to make sure that somebody walked in the world for them. In other words, took the most important things from their lives and incorporated into the life of people who will live on. So when I talk about legacy, sometimes for some of us, we're fortunate we can leave a, a broader legacy, but for many other people, it's, it's just as critical and just as important and just as moving to leave a legacy in the form of a letter or any kind of document that you write to people that, that tells them what was most important to you, what values do you, do you wanna pass on? The, the two oh. values, by the way, just for the record, the two values that people talked about most were wisdom and compassion. Those are the two things. Wow. Being wise and making the wise choices in life and compassion, being kind. Wow. You, um, uh, one of the, uh, the other uh, things that I love, quotes in your book, you talk about slowing down can be the kiss of life. Um, tell us a little bit uh, about like how, you know, about, you know, what you found in your research in the book, your experience of it. And I've, I got a great question from uh, one of the uh, registrants <laughs> said, you know, how do we, how can we really do that? Slow ourselves down, the mind, the body down after so many years of sort of this active phase um, of life um, and out of this habitual uh, movement of one thing to another, one thing and, and to another. Well, there are two, two questions there. One is the question, how can we do it? How can we slow down? The other is why? Why do we do it? What benefit is there? First, the first question, how do we do it? The, the word mindfulness is so apparent in the world right now. In the last mm -hmm. 20 years, mindfulness has gone from something on the fringe of some of the, the more spiritual orientations to something that's quite mainstream. It's a form of meditation. It's a form of sitting still, watching the breath, and slow, slowly, slowly moving your attention to your breathing. And you find that if you do it regularly, slowing down becomes actually a natural process, a rather healthy process. The speed, the speed with which we lived our younger life is not appropriate when we get older. And so mm -hmm. learn to slow down. Read something about mindfulness. It's everywhere. You, it's very easy to get a hold of. And in fact, I talk about it in our wisdom years in my book. I talk about mindfulness practice. Yeah, yeah, now, you do. The second thing is why? Why is it important to slow down when we get older? Well, think of all the things we miss when we're running around, checking things off our to-do list, checking things off our calendar, racing around from one meeting to another, we, we miss so much. And the one thing that, that I heard from older people more than anything when I asked the question, what do you feel you missed by racing around so much? They said beauty, I, the beauty of the world, the beauty of the world, the subtle things. So people talk when they got older, they talk so much about sitting still and just watching whether it's a sunset or a sunrise, whether it was watching a baby or watching kids play whether it was playing with their annual animal companions. Um, they, when they sat still, they were able to enjoy those things that traditionally got missed when they were racing around. Hmm. You know, one, uh, one of the things um, 
uh, that I love about the book that it's, it's structured in a way that's inspiring, but it's also, you know, I would say not only meant to be read, but meant to be um, sort of really uh, as a roadmap uh, for growing older with joy, fulfillment, and resilience. There are a lot of um, uh, questions in there that you give to contemplate. There are exercises as well. Um, you guide us through nine, what you call nine tasks of transformation under three broader levels of exploration. And, and for those of you on the call who haven't uh, read the book, I'll, uh, you know, I'd like to sort of voice these three broader levels of exploration because I, I personally love it. You talk about tuning into the voice of wisdom, uh, seeing your life through wisdom's eyes and heart as the second one, and then the third broader category, you talk about opening to the eternal. And I tell you, one of the, out of the nine tasks, uh, one of them that I really like is the first one. You know, you talk about convening an inner council of advisors. And I love that one because, you know, I think as a society, we're so, um, you know, almost it's, it's instinctual for us to go out and get advice from, uh, you know, from an, from an external advisor or a mentor, which I think are all are great things. But I love that you talk about the first half as going inside, really, convening an inner council of advisor. And I, I'd like for you to just share those three for us, if, sure. if, you, if you don't mind. The, uh, the council of advisors? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's one of my favorite parts of the book also. It's interesting you should say that. Uh, yeah. There are three sources of wisdom that you can count on as you get older. One is the wise self, the wise self, the, the wisest part of yourself, the part that you'll hear if you sit still and pay attention. The most powerful discovery in psychology is introspection introspection, instead of paying attention externally, instead of being externally directed so much, pay attention to that still small voice within. And, and particularly the wisest part of that counsel is people are a lot wiser than they think they are. So that's number one. Second, death is an advisor. We have less time when we get older and death looms, even if it's not necessarily soon, it becomes much more apparent in our thinking. We know more people who have died. We know more people who are ill. The threat of death is more real. What does death tell you about how do you want to use your life most in a most fulfilling fashion? How do you make the best use of the time you have left? And death can be both intimidating, but it also can be a very, very important advisor. And then second, third rather, Third is the wise adult. What do you want to carry over from your adult years that you learned that's that is still important to you? You may still want to achieve things. You still might want to do things that make a difference in the lives of other people. And you may want to learn from your adult years that there are ways of doing that. Uh, you know, I, t I talk a lot about in, in the book about how how we can take what we learned in our adult years and make it worthwhile and useful in our later years, in our wisdom years. And uh, yeah. it, there's a lot. You don't want to throw away everything that you learned in your adult years. You, you couldn't do that anyway, even if you wanted to. But ask the question, what do I want to carry over and what do I want to let go of? Yeah. I also loved how um, I resonated with the distinction that you made between um, uh, sort of the wise self and the wise adult self is that the soul centered adult. The third one, you, you talk about how the soul centered adult is the one that has learned over the course of many years, to, you know, how to action things, right? How to do things, you know, how to make things happen. And it's in the later years, it's really about taking that, um, that agency and that effort and really uh, sort of being at the disposal of the why self, right? Um, and so I think that was beautifully said that, you know, that distinction between those two inner advisors. 
No, but thank you. You you really did read the book. I appreciate it. I did. <laughs> you know the uh, the two questions that really summarize those three advisors. The two questions that are really urgent and and, and empowering for older people are: Who is your soul calling you to be? And what is your soul calling you to do? What kind of person do I want to be? As, as advised by my soul? And what kind of work do I want to be doing in the world? What does my soul tell me that, that's a, that really informs me best about the work I want to do in the world? Uh, those are the two questions that are really important to ask. And you can spend many hours really answering those questions to your advantage. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Garfield, I, I, one of the things I want to ask you, the title of your book um, is talking about growing older with joy, fulfillment, resilience, and no regrets. I'd like to ask you about regrets and, you know, uh, how do we alleviate uh, regret, regret? Can we really alleviate it or is, is it something that you sort of learn to uh, come to terms with? in your, your later years? How do, you, how do you look at regret? Yeah, it's an important question. I spent a lot of time with dying people. I spent many, many hours with literally over decades, hundreds of people who have died. One of the saddest things you can imagine are people who, who look at me with, with this faraway look in their eye and they say, you know what I always regret about my life? And then they tell me their story, whatever it happens to be. And I always ask the question, why do you why didn't you do something about the regret and they say i never thought about it i never thought i could do anything about it well what i suggest in the book is writing a forgiveness letter either to somebody else who wronged you about something you regret or a forgiveness letter to yourself and in that forgiveness letter include the observation that you did the best you could considering who you were at the time and what you knew at the time, you couldn't have done it any other way, given who you were. And secondly, what you learned from what, what happened that you'll never do again. What you learned, write a forgiveness letter. You don't always have to mail it, by the way. Just externalizing it, just getting it down on paper can be therapeutic. What you most want psychologically is to lay the burden down. Lay the burden of regret down. And, and the way to do that is through forgiveness. Wow. Um, I'd like to ask you just a little bit about, I, I, I'm going to ask some questions that uh, uh, some of the registrants um, shared. Can you talk a little bit about how to deal with feelings of loneliness or potentially feelings of running out of time? Did you, did you come across that at all in your research? And what did any of your research um uh, you know, produce for you about those loneliness and, and potentially the feeling of running out of time. Okay. Well, as far as loneliness, loneliness is concerned, all of us have periods of loneliness. I think it's important to recognize the fact that you're not being picked on, that it's not something that's just happening to you, particularly in the current situation that we're in in this country. We're, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Many people have to shelter in place. Many people yeah. are alone, alone in sheltering in place. And even if yeah. you're not, a lot of us are spending more time alone. What can you do that will enliven your life? What can you read? What can you write? What can you do to build the kind of day? Think about building a day. What kind of day will leave you less alone? We have so many ways of reaching out now. Write a letter. I don't mean just online. You can do it online. You can send an email, but it's more personal to write a letter by hand in the old fashioned way. Or you can use the telephone or you can use what we're using right now. You can Zoom with people. You can use all sorts of other technologies to get in touch with people. Be the person who reaches out. Don't just sit and wait for people to reach out to you. Try to mm -hmm. minimize the loneliness. Minimize the loneliness by reaching out to other people and ask yourself the question, who would I like to get closer to that I haven't reached out to? And write a yeah. list of two or three people who are important to you 
And don't don't worry about what response you'll get. Don't worry about whether or not they'll receive your your uh, message uh, in a in a positive way. Just just reach out. I think it's a question of two things: recognizing that all of us have periods of aloneness, particularly now in the world, the way the world is now. And secondly, that you can do something about it. That there's a sense of agency that you can bring to aloneness, to, to loneliness that minimizes the negative aspect of it. Now you had a yeah. second question and I've forgotten what it is. That's, that's the second one, feelings of running out of time. Well, the truth of the matter is that when we get older, that's pressing. You do have less time, that there is less time, it, but we don't know how much. And just as I said earlier, the fastest growing segment of the population are centenarians, people over 100. So you, if you're 65, you could have 35 more years. You don't know how much time you have. Um, the real question is, how do you make the time most fulfilling? What will allow you to make the time most fulfilling? And I have, there are, there are five ingredients, five things to look at, and I'd be glad to go over them very briefly. One is, what, do. what mission would you like to accomplish in the time you have left? And by mission, I mean, what do you want to invest your, your, your essential energies in? What do you want to invest your essential energies in? Could be a hobby, could be volunteer work, could be creative work of some sort. What's your mission? Second, what goals do you have? Goals are dreams with deadlines. Goals are steps toward completing the mission. Short-term, intermediate, long-term goals. Third, feedback. Who do you need feedback from to help you best articulate the, the use of your life, the, the most fulfilling use of your life? Who do you wanna to talk to for advice? What kind of mentoring do you want to get in for whom, from whom? Uh, uh, fourth would be resources. What resources do you need? You might need to take a course. You might need to learn a little something. Say you want to learn, say you want to write your memoirs. I took a memoir writing class about 10 years ago. I was amazed. There were over a hundred people there. And when the teacher asked, how many of you want to publish your memoirs? I was the only one who raised his hand. They weren't thinking about publishing it. They were thinking about writing their memoirs for their grandchildren or for their children. Uh, what kind of course do you need to fulfill that mission? What kind of resources do you need? What kind of advice do you need? And then last, what rewards do you most want from completing the mission? What rewards the most one? It, and it may just be um, you want to feel grateful for having lived a life that's fulfilling. Well, what kind of rewards do you want? So it's mission, goals, feedback, resources, and rewards. Wow. Wow. Thank you. So there is uh, so there's another question, and, and this it, maybe you can uh, pull something out of your research. How do men and women look at um, our wisdom years differently? Or did you see any difference at all? Yeah, there were differences, and it's a great question. Just like in earlier years, but even more so, women knew how to reach out. Women, women knew how to connect with other people, particularly other women. They knew how to uh, band together and bond more easily. Uh, it was a more natural thing to reach out to other women just for support, for friendship. Uh, when there were difficulties, men had more trouble. In fact, there were, there's quite a bit of research on why men live uh, shorter lives. And one of the reasons is either an inability or in most cases an unwillingness to admit that they need support, that they need assistance. Wow. So they don't reach out and they stay alone and they die of heartbreak. They die of a broken heart, uh, men that is. Uh, so you know, one of the major differences is in the area of relationships. Women knew how to cultivate relationships far better than men. Wow. Um, this is a question that's uh, pertinent to the times that we're in. Uh, in our later years, how can we improve resilience 
especially during times like this, which can, can be experienced as very chaotic uh, and extreme. Are, do you have um, sort of any advice for, uh, you know, the current experience that we're all uh, having in terms of um, a lot of social unrest, um, the global pandemic, the shelter in place. Um, what sort of advice can you share? Well, the, the, the original question was about resilience and, and resilience, yes. resilience, and you might say resi resilience in a world gone crazy. Uh, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> there's so much going on right now that's, that's stressful for people. So let's take a look first at the physical aspect of resilience and then the emotional and psychological aspect. The physical re aspect of resilience really has to do with what we all know, but don't always do. There's so much great information out there on health care, on nutrition, on exercise, on working up a game plan for yourself so that you're physically more resilient. Uh, you know, the I'm 76 years old. I work out five times a week. I have friends who are just as physically fit and more physically fit than I am. What 75 or 76 or 80 means now is much different than what it meant years ago. Uh, people are in good shape now, but only if you pay attention. Pay attention to health care, your health care needs. Uh, your, your physician knows more than, than he or she did uh, 20 years ago. Make sure yeah. you... You don't ignore your, your physical needs. And then emotionally and psychologically, the most important thing I can say is what I said earlier about mindfulness. Pay attention to mindfulness. Sit still. Meditate. Ask yourself deep questions about what is my heart calling me to do? Who is my heart calling me to be? What does my soul want from me? Ask these interest, important introspective questions. Resilience is really a function of inner strength, and that inner strength comes from being wise and from being compassionate. Mm. Beautiful. Uh, Dr. Garfield, in, the, in a few minutes, I'll, I'll turn it over to see if we have any questions uh, out there from any of the participants. But, you know, early in the very early chapters of the book, you talked about this um, paradigm of successful or active aging being problematic in later life. What, what do you mean by that? Can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. There are two paradigms of aging that we see in the world, and both of them have serious shortcomings. One is uh, the, the one that you talked about. Um, active aging. I'm as good as I ever was. Nothing's different. Uh, I'm as good as I ever was. Well, ask somebody who's 70 whether they're as physically fit as they were when they were 20, and they'll laugh at you. Of course not. Of course things have changed. Of course, being active in the same way as you were earlier makes no sense. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't be active. It just means that you have to adjust and be adapt and be realistic about it. Active aging is not being the same as who you always were. It has to do with what is the upper limit of what I'm capable of now and what's realistic and fulfilling in my current life. And then the second is you hear people talk about aging being all negative, decline and debilitation, I call it. Uh, that it's all negative, that there's nothing good about it. That's not what I heard from all of the people I talked to. They had challenges. Many of them had physical challenges but they realized that there were potentials and promises that could be fulfilled in later life that were far more interesting and compelling than they ever dreamed of. So even though, the, even though there is some decline in, in our mental capacities, and it, it can be decline in our physical, certainly in our physical capacities, what mm. we do find is that there's an increase in our ability to be wise and an ability to be compassionate. So there's actually an increase in the two values that are most important for human beings. Yeah, I I, um, I pulled out one uh, brief paragraph that I, I love. You say, our own culture pushes us not to pause and dissolve, feel and reflect, 
We're immersed in the paradigm of successful or active aging, which suggests that our choice is either to speed across the border into later life by actively, by staying active as before or to slide into the decline. There's little encouragement for staying still long enough to discover who we might be if we set aside our expectations of the past, choose our own goals, our own shape, our own pace, and our own course. Action culture is so pervasive that it's almost invisible. And before we can create the space to answer the new callings of later life, it's helpful to understand how staying in a state of constant busyness can crowd our dreams out. So I, I really thought it was, I think you you said well there that it, it wasn't this sort of um, uh, two uh, choice, uh, model in terms of, of um, you know, growing old um, with wisdom. Um, you know, it wasn't either one or the other. There was a place in between um, uh, of, that, you know, you could pause and, and really think and, and reset. So I thought that was beautifully said. Well, thank you. It's something that's very important to me and something that was very important to the people I interviewed for the book. That they uh, that they really learned how they learned introspection. They learned to pause. What I think of as pausing at the threshold, pause, mm. pay attention, ask yourself important questions about what is the best use of my life, how can I make the best use of these years, how can they be most fulfilling in the time that I have, how can my my time be most fulfilling, however long that is, and people are much more reflective, self-reflective, in their later years. And it's something that I teach in the book. In fact, that's why I call the book Our Wisdom Years. The wisdom comes from reflection. Yeah. So one, um, I, I have a question here. How can we best deal with loss and still move ahead? Well, first again, let's normalize loss. Let's normalize in the, in the sense that we all lose. We all lose people. We all lose things, we all lose jobs, we all lose homes. I don't mean we lose all of those things, we all lose some of those things. Loss is pervasive in the world. So mm -hmm. it, it's not a bad break. It's not just a bad break. It's something that is part of the human condition. Now the question is, how do we deal with loss? And I, I think about that in, in what I wrote in the book under the general heading of what are the gifts of suffering? What are the gifts of suffering? When we lose, we suffer. It hurts, it doesn't feel good at all, particularly if it's an important loss, like the loss of a person mm. we love. What are mm. the gifts of that suffering? And the answer to the question is, what did I learn? What, what, what can I learn from this situation that will improve the time I have left? What do I learn? It's always the question that we ask. What is the, what is the ultimate learning from the person I lost? from the situation that changed? What are the most important lessons that I can now live into the future? Uh, so again, you know, loss, loss is something that needs to be normalized in the sense that yeah. it hits all of us. Uh, yeah. But what are the primary lessons that we can learn from those losses? And how do, we, how do we introject, how do we take them inside ourselves so that we become better people as a consequence of the losses? Beautiful. I'm, I'm just going to pause here and see, Henry, I don't know if you can hear me. Um, and I don't know if we have any uh, questions coming through uh, the chat at all or, or questions from uh, anyone. But I just want to pause and, and, and take a second and see if, uh, if we have anything coming through. I can hear you, and as of now, there are no questions in coming through the chat. Okay. Dr. Garfield, I have, um, I, I, I have uh, another question here. You, know, you spent, uh, as you mentioned before, you spent quite uh, a lot of hours in your work life with uh, people who are in the last stages of life. Um, people with uh, terminal illnesses, um, living with terminal illnesses. What is, what is 
the one thing that you have found most important from those experiences, from, from you know, sitting with, with those people, sitting with their families? What's the one thing, as, as Oprah Winfrey says, that you know for sure uh, because of it? The one thing I know for sure is the need for a compassionate presence, the need to have a compassionate presence there, to have somebody who steps up and is the difference, what I, what I describe as the difference between zero and one, the difference yeah. between having one person there who's really willing to be with you and to listen to you, to listen from the heart, to speak from the heart, to act from the heart. So one person who's willing to be there, the difference between that and having nobody, having nobody, even though people may visit, they're not really there. They're not really paying yeah. attention. There's a big difference between being a compassionate presence and being fully present and just showing up, just, just having your body show up, but you're not really there. You can't wait to get out of the room because it's a difficult situation. Um, that would be, if, if I had to pick one thing, the one thing that makes the difference, I would say it was that. And, and Dr. Garfield, was that part of your impetus for founding uh, the Shanti Project? Absolutely. Absolutely. I was a, a young psychologist in a cancer unit, and there were 40 patients. They were all seriously ill. They all needed somebody, and I couldn't do it all. There were 40 people there. So I started a volunteer program in 1974. 46 years ago, I started a volunteer program. I trained, wow. trained people in peer counseling, how to be a counselor to people who were really up against it, who were seriously ill. And I matched those young volunteers with the patients that we had at the Cancer Institute. And it worked. It was a wonderful model that worked. And now hundreds of other organizations around the world have used the peer support model that I developed in a variety of applications, in a variety of ways, not just in mm -hmm. cancer, but in AIDS. Now in COVID, we have a COVID program at Shanti Project. Uh, it's really quite striking how adaptable the program has been. Yeah, phenomenal. Uh, Dr. Garfield, so tell me, what did you find were the, um, what did you find were the, the key needs in terms of um, Shante adapting to create sort of a COVID program in terms of pandemic, in, in, at the time of the, this uh, pandemic? What did you what did uh, you see? What did your volunteers, your leadership on the ground see in terms of of needs, particularly to uh, COVID? Well, particularly with COVID, what we we hear most often are questions that we talked about earlier: loneliness, questions of loneliness, wanting not to be alone so much, wanting to mm. wanting to understand how to mitigate loneliness, how to minimize it, and then secondly. People wanted good information, trustworthy information. It's hard to know who to trust yeah. in the world anymore. They wanted yeah. to know what it was sources of trustworthy information about COVID so that they did the right things, so they didn't run into trouble with the disease. Those are the two things. What do I do about loneliness and how do I get good information? Interesting. Did you ever think that uh, Shanti Project, when you, you were a young psychologist uh, back during that time, did you ever think it would blossom to be what it is today? And we were talking about earlier that more than likely, uh, you were asking the question, but I'm, sure, I'm pretty sure it will uh, outlast you, uh, this legacy of Shanti Project. What did, you, did you ever think um, that you would be stepping into something so big? No, never. I never did. In fact, interestingly enough, I get asked that question all the time. And I, I think back and I, and the real truth of the matter is, we were just trying to get through the day. We were just trying to get through the year. We had to raise money every single year for 46 years. And wow. so, oh, I, I never thought that we'd last this long. I never thought it would have an impact like this. Uh, but I'm extremely grateful that it's, uh, it, it has made the impact that it's made. Yeah, really phenomenal. We have a question in the chat, Denise. Okay, I do see a question. It says, in the Shanti program, what was the dying person's greatest psychological need? 
the greatest psychological need was having a compassionate presence, what we talked about before. Having a compassionate presence, somebody who will speak from the heart, who will listen from the heart, who will act from the heart, somebody who's willing to be there as an advocate. And by advocate, I mean somebody who's willing to show up, pay attention, and care. Uh, just mm. to really be there. It, it, it's a scary time. It can be a difficult time. It can be a, a painful time physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Uh, can you share it? Can somebody be there to share it with you? That was the most important need. Wow. Um, I have a question here about um, gratitude, and I, I know you touched on this uh, a little bit earlier, but can you share with share a little bit of the uh, some of the practices uh, you talked about in the book? Uh, about seeing through the lens of uh, gratitude? Well, actually, it boils down to one question. Gr gratitude, gratitude at its core has one question, which is, what are you most grateful for in your life? And then secondarily, how do you get more of that in your life? What are you most grateful for? Perhaps you might ask, who are you most grateful for? And how can you build that into your life in a more present, ever-present way. So it's focusing on gratitude itself as a practice. Just focusing on that turns out to be one of the most important things in living a fulfilling life at whatever age, but particularly later on. It becomes more obvious for older people. When I mention mm -hmm. gratitude to people over 60, people in their 60s, 70s, 80s, or even older, they know what I'm talking about instinctually. They, yeah. they talk about it quickly and they talk about it with great passion and great pathos and great enthusiasm, what they're most grateful for. Um, younger people don't always think in those terms. They don't always think about gratitude. They think that they're responsible for, for building their world and they're the, they're the ones who are making it happen alone. And so they're self-reliant and they don't need anybody else. And they don't have to be grateful for anybody else's contribution, which is never true. It wasn't true when we were 25, and it's certainly not true when we were 75. But uh, asking that question about what, what or who are you most grateful for in your life, and how do you build that into your life in a more ever-present fashion? In, um, in that, you know, I was talking earlier about these three broader areas of, of um, exploration that you sort of uh, structure the book by. The last one is called Opening to uh, the Eternal. Can you uh, share just a little bit more about, you know, about that and what do you mean uh, about opening to the eternal in, in, in our later years? Well, if I talked about it with regard to terminal patients, you'd understand it in a flash. People mm. ask the question, is there an afterlife? They ask the question about is there anything after this life? So there's an opening to the eternal that happens there. But it also happens with people in their wisdom years, whether or not they have a terminal condition. They may be feeling fine, but people ask more questions because death is an advisor. And when death is an advisor, one of the things that death advises is to think more about the eternal. For instance, the question, now that you've entered your wisdom years, how is your relationship to God or the mystery, or the eternal. How has it changed now that you're older? How is it different, if at all? May not may not be any different, but you know you, I, what I find is people in their later years they may be religious, they may not, but but many of them are spiritual, whether or not they're religious. They yeah. they may be spirit. There may be a sense of a greater reality that they sense, that they that they feel in their bones, that they feel in their heart and their soul. And they talk about that. They talk about that, that sense of, of what is greater than us, what is greater than everything we can see with the senses. It becomes a topic of great enth enthusiastic attention for older people. I had no trouble getting people involved in that discussion. Yeah. I love, uh, I mean, this, is, this has been years ago. I read something. Um, it almost sounds a little bit cheeky, but it's, uh, it, you know, it says, find death before death finds you. 
Um, and I think that's a, that's a little bit of what you're talking about with, um, you know, use death as one of your inner advisors. I, and I love that it's um, the way you phrase it is really almost as a, as a friend, right? It's sort of um, uh, in a way that is, uh, you know, helpful to you rather than, and then many people see the converse, having the conversation about death, something to be put off, something to be, um, you know, saved for another day or ignored. So I, I love that you sort of uh, give us a bit of a different take uh, uh, on death. Absolutely. You know, and, I'd, I'd ask people to, to, to ponder the question, if I had one year to live, how would I spend that year? What would I be doing if I had one year to live? Just write wow. it out. Write it out. What would my life be like? For some people, it's I'd be doing exactly what I'm doing now. And those are the most fulfilled people. But for other people, you see them writing stuff that's very different than how they're living their life. And I asked the question, well, you just told me that if you had one year to live, you'd, this is how you'd live your, your most fulfilling life. Why not do it now, whether or not you have a year to live? Well, I see that we've got uh, a couple of questions, Dr. Garfield. One is how to deal with a dying person that doesn't feel well enough to talk or seem to want much company or caring? Sit still. Just sit still. You don't have to talk. When my, I sat with both of my parents and my best friend when they were dying. And I was the one at the bedside for all three. And there were times when they, all three of them couldn't talk. None of them could talk. And they didn't seem to have the energy to, to engage this world at all. Sit still. Hold somebody's hand if, if that's reasonable to do. Um, just sit at the bedside. I remember sitting with my mother for an hour saying nothing. No television, no words, no conversation. Finally, she opened her eyes and she looked at me and she said, I'm so glad you're here. Wow. I had no idea she even knew I was there. Wow. So don't think that it's going to be about always about powerful conversation. It's sometimes just sitting still quietly. Mm. I've got uh, a second question, or maybe it's a comment. Dr. Garfield's thoughts on sharing this wisdom with younger adults who may not appreciate some of what he's sharing. For example, slowing down, uh, taking time to reflect uh, versus always doing. So m maybe the question is, have you found um, quite a bit of crossover of your, of, in terms of audience for your book. I know I'm, I, I just turned 50 <laughs> not that long ago, but I was really, really engaged um, uh, with your book and, and thought that it was some profound things in there, especially because you write it in the way that it's, it really is a roadmap, right? And, and you know, even if you're approaching um, what you call your, your post-adult years, uh, I mean, a roadmap allows you the vision to sort of look ahead and, and see and think and, and contemplate. Yeah, you know, the, the whole notion of younger people is very interesting, very interesting question. The uh, responses to the book from younger people, people in their 40s and 50s, people younger than that, people in their 20s and 30s has been something I never would have imagined. And I, I started thinking, why are they interested in a book on our, called Our Wisdom Years? And then I realized the answer was right in front of me. I didn't even see it. They wanted to understand their parents and grandparents. Yeah. They wanted to understand their parents and grandparents better. So they got a book on how to live later life because they wanted to be a more compassionate family member or friend to somebody who was older. So one other question here, and, and we're going to have to wrap up. It's, uh, has there ever been any research done on why men have such a hard time reaching out for support or admitting that they need support, and is there a way of providing training in this area? Yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful question. There's a lot that's been written in what's called social psychology about male attitudes. It's mostly about how men are, are, are reared how uh, they're taught to be self-reliant. Rely on yourself. You don't need anybody else. Well, that's, that was never true. 
that was a that was a raw deal that men got that we got uh, that was never true. We were never taught uh, to reach out. We were never taught about relationships. And the the way to minimize it is to emphasize that reaching out is not weakness. It, relationships are not a weakness. It's actually strength. It's actually wisdom. And people older older men start realizing it slowly, not nearly as well as women do, but slowly realize that reaching out can make them feel a whole lot better. So it uh, it has to do with the way boys are brought up and taught to be men and be self reliant and not need anybody else, which was always, as I say, a raw deal. It was it was never true. It was never useful. But uh, you, you yes, you can learn how to emphasize relationships much more in your later years. Oh. Dr. Garfield, so tell me, I just wanted to sort of ask you, is there anything else you want to share with us uh, before, we, before we leave? Well, just to recognize, yes, to recognize the fact that our wisdom years, the title of the book, our wisdom years, is a stage of life just as important as adulthood was. If you remember way back when you were an adolescent, you were a teenager, and you became an adult. Well, things were different. You weren't, a, you weren't a teenager anymore. Things were dramatically different when you were an adult. You were raising a family, perhaps, or building a career, perhaps. Things were different. Well, now things are different again, just as powerfully different. It's just as important. This transition is just as important as the transition from the teen years to adulthood. Pay attention to it, honor it the way it needs to be honored, and it can be some of the most fulfilling times in your life. Wow. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I've got some comments in the chat that are saying, great interview. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Garfield. We really, really appreciate it. For all of you out there, please definitely um, pick up Dr. Garfield's book. You can go online or support your local bookstore. Uh, it's called Our Wisdom Years, Growing Older with Joy, Fulfillment, Resilience, uh, and No Regrets. Um, thank you so much. If you want more information on the Institute for Global Transformation and the work that we do and the events that we put on, feel free to go to our website. Uh, sign up as a member and you'll be on our mailing list and be aware of everything that we've got uh, coming up. Thank you, Dr. Garfield.